All right, all right. Many blessings, many blessings. Welcome to House 633. Welcome to the house uh, of the Lord here. I, uh, I'm honored to be able to be here in, in front of every single one of you guys, and I'm honored to be here in front of everybody that is watching through social media. This is our midweek service, so it's uh, we could have been anywhere, but we decided that we wanted to come to the house of the Lord, and we wanted to serve Him, and we wanted to worship Him, and we wanted to hear a word from God. So uh, blessings to everybody that is here and blessings to everybody that is joining us through social media. Uh, I was giving, uh, I was checking the stats the other day uh, and there were like five different countries that were tuning in. So sometimes you, you don't know where the word of God is going to land and you don't know where the people that are listening and tuning in are from. So uh, if you're from any one of those countries that are tuning in today, we, we are honored that you are here with us. We're honored that you're tuning in on a weekly basis and we are honored to be able to present the word of God to you uh, and most importantly I am honored to be able to be here at the, at the head of, of this uh, marvelous congregation uh, the best congregation in the world but I'm a little bit biased <laughs> you know but uh, it, is, it is the truth uh, without them uh, being here without their support uh, it would be impossible to be able to go out there and do uh, what God has called me out to do because when God calls somebody he doesn't send him by himself. He always gives him a team, a group of people that support him, a group of people that encourage him, and a group of people that push him so that he can be able to give more. So uh, having people here that, that have believed in the vision actually stretches me, uh, actually causes me to be able to develop even more, and it causes me to be to come here and be sharp, you know, not necessarily just uh, just to speak, but to be able to give more. So let's get uh, right on into the word. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it to 45 minutes and I'm trying to practice this because once I start talking, I kind of like just go and, and you know, two hours later, uh, <laughs> then people like are telling me, hey, you've been speaking for two hours now. So uh, we're going to try to practice 45 minutes uh, to, to try to be able to uh, uh, keep the attention span of people because uh, people after 45 minutes they seem to tune out so even if I speak more they won't receive more so let's just keep it to to 45 minutes so that they can be able to receive I'm gonna ask you uh, brother Andy 45 minutes just give me the sign <laughs> so that I can stop so if you're if you're with me uh, if you can turn to the book of James chapter 1 verse 5 and I want to continue uh, in this theme, uh, today's message is called the danger of being lukewarm. The danger of being lukewarm. So we've been talking about this uh, topic for the last couple of messages. And I honestly believe that we have hit a nerve. Uh, we have hit a chord uh, with people. Uh, I've have gotten some, uh, you know, I've had, have had some conversations with people. And people have reached out to me and... and and it feels like uh, this message has really convicted some people, uh, which is the intention of the Word of God. The Word of God is not necessarily just there to uplift you, to encourage you, and, and to catapult you into where God wants to take you. But the most important thing that the Word of God is trying to do is, it is trying to convict you. It is trying to, uh, trying to bring conviction of the truth of the Word of God so that you can develop a relationship with God that will stand the test of time. And, and, that's, uh, and that's what we're really looking for here in House 633. We're trying to get people to develop a relationship with God that is going to that is gonna be able to stand the test of time. Meaning that it's not going to be cyclical. I'm not going to follow God for three months and then I'm going to step away for another three months. I'm not going to come to church and I'm going to be excited for a couple of services and then I'm going to you know, be disappointed for the next three months. No, we're trying to create conviction. We're trying to create belief into the Word of God. And we're trying to bring order into the life of people so that they can be able to enjoy every single promise that the Bible uh, has in store for us. Uh, as we were talking in previous messages, uh, we have the tendency in the religious community or in the Christian community to always uh, try to come up with a positive message, a motivational message, a message of encouragement. Uh, 
and a message about all the promises of God. And like I said, I'm not saying that those are not necessarily true uh, or not necessarily fake, should I say, or, or false. I just believe that they are half true simply because they only show you like the good things but they don't show you the things that you need to be able to correct in order to receive them. So people go right after them, and because the, their character bears no fruit, uh, they fall halfway through the race, and they get disappointed, they get discouraged, and simply put, they just leave the church altogether. Uh, I was reading some, some very disturbing stats when it comes to the Christian church, the community of, uh, of believers, and it looks like there is a heavy exodus of young people leaving the church. Uh, a, a big exodus of people just abandoning the church altogether simply because they weren't taught um, the foundation or, or the foundation of what the gospel really is. And they were just taught basically uh, a form of motivational gospel. <laughs> where everything in the gospel is good, where everything that's going to happen in your life is good, where God wants to be able to extend your territories, where God wants to be able to come in and prosper you, where God wants to give you houses and cars, and God wants to be able to do all these wonderful things in your life, but it, they don't teach you how to be in right standing with God. They don't teach you how to align your thoughts with God, and they don't teach you uh, how to be able to come back to the will of God. Yet, when, when you go after all of these things uh, without the proper foundation and, and you fail, uh, it causes a big conflict uh, within the spirit of the person, a big disappointment, uh, and they tend to believe that the gospel is not true. And they tend to believe that the gospel uh, is a fairy tale or or. or, or they were books that were written by people that, were, that, that tried to make up this story a very long time ago, but that it is not a living word. And, and honestly, um, I want to be able to talk to everybody that is here and the people that are listening to me on the other side. Uh, the Bible, the Word of God, every letter that is written here in the New Testament and the Old Testament, according to Scripture, it says, it says that it's a living organism. It says that it's a living spirit. So when the word is spoken, it's a living spirit that comes to give life to your spirit. Uh, so, but if we don't believe that, then we close our hearts uh, to the word and the word has no place to land. So it can't produce the fruits that it was intended to do. Uh, we were talking about uh, a, a couple of weeks ago uh, that even though the kingdom is available, even though the kingdom is accessible, even though that we can participate of everything that the kingdom has to offer, we find a big problem. The problem is that people come with unteachable hearts. Mm, yeah. uh, people come here not with willing to be taught the word of God because they already have a perception in their mind. They already have a, a concept, an idea that was embedded in them that does not allow them to be able to, uh, to, to walk hand in hand with God. So as we were talking this last couple of weeks about the lukewarm citizen and the lukewarm believers, I want to continue and I want to talk about the dangers of being lukewarm because there is a very big danger when we don't decide to make a decision to follow God with all of our hearts. God did not bring us into the church, to the ecclesia, so that we can be half-hearted. God did not bring us into his presence just so that we can give him half of ourselves. He didn't bring us here just so that, so that we can occasionally worship him. He didn't bring us here so that uh, once in a while, you know, we, we can open up the Bible. Or once in a while, uh, we're going to go into this prayer session. So that once in a while, I'm going to feel him when, when there's a worship going on. Uh, God brought us here so that we can experience the fullness of God. Yeah, so good. God brought us here so that the Holy Spirit can lead us and guide us into the fullness of God. So that we can be able to not only be delivered, but walk into freedom. So I want to talk about this real quick before I read this verse and we continue. There is a difference between being delivered and being free. And we were talking about that deliverance is simply being uh, away or being separated from the oppressor. But that doesn't make you free. 
Right. It just means that the whatever it was that was oppress oppressing you is not present. So if we talk about people that are that are engaged in a particular sin, and let's just say that the sin that oppresses them, uh, God comes through His blood, He cleanses other sins, and He removes them from that sin. Now they're saints. Now they're holy. They've been delivered. They're fine, right. but doesn't mean that they're free. Right. Why? Because freedom comes once we understand the revelation of the truths of God. Freedom comes when we enter into the kingdom of God. Because <coughs> Jesus says that he was the way. He was the door. And that there was no way back to the Father except through him. So he became a door, an access point back to the Father... He, he's the access way back into the presence of God. He's the access door back into the kingdom of God. So God is saying, I am going to deliver you from the world. But now you have to make a conscious decision to enter the door into the kingdom of God. Yes, that's good. That is now your responsibility. It is now up to you to decide if you want to stay outside of the door or if you want to enter through the door. Because Jesus is a door. A door is not there simply for you to look at it. A door yeah. is there so that you can open it and enter through that door into what's on the other side of that door. So, if you don't enter into what, what's on the other side, then you will always stay in the same condition. So God is saying, I have delivered you. I have rescued you from sin. I have shed my blood. And now the Holy Spirit is here to remind you of all the things that I taught you while I was still there that you didn't understand yet. But now that the Holy Spirit is here, he's saying, walk and enter through the door. So my question is to everybody that is here, people that are listening to me on the other side, have you crossed the door yet? Mm. Have you entered through the door that is Jesus Christ into the realm of the kingdom? Or are you still in the realm of the world worshiping the door? Mm, that's good. What are you doing? Because a lot of people complain to God that they're still stuck in a condition and God is saying, have you gone through the door? Mm. Or are you simply just worshiping the door? That's good. So I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit now here within us, His intention is to force you because willingly we won't go that's why the holy spirit says that he's the only one that can convict you mm. when you're convicted you no longer have a choice mm. when you're convicted you have already been decreed and you have already been found guilty and now the only thing that 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 is left is for you to be able to uh to serve the sentence that was given to you the good news is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he became our lawyer. So when we went into the courtroom of the Father and we were convicted that we were guilty mm -hmm. of all of the sins that, and falling short of his glory, his blood is the one that testified in our behalf that we had already accepted him and then we were no longer given what we deserve, which was hell. Now we were given our inheritance, which was the kingdom. My question is, what have you accepted? Have you accepted uh, the kingdom or have you accepted condemnation? Because most of us say that we believe in Jesus Christ and most of us say that we have already accepted his sacrifice. But when we look at our lifestyles, the Bible says you shall know them by their fruit, not by their gift. So we have a lot of gifted people in the church, people that can play the piano, people that can speak, people that, that know how to usher, people that are good securities, people that have multiple talents, but they don't have fruit. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, I didn't come here to make you talented. I came here so that you can bear fruit. And if you can't bear fruit, that gives witness that the Holy Spirit hasn't convicted you yet. Mm, that's good. Mm. And that's why we're talking about this theme, lukewarm believers. And we're talking about the dangers of being lukewarm. Why? Because when you're lukewarm, the Holy Spirit is not there. Mm. But you believe He is. Mm. When you're lukewarm, 
You believe that because you come to church, that because you play a piano, that because you're preaching at an altar, that because you're serving in any area of ministry, you're a teacher for the youth, a teacher for the young adults, you're a teacher uh, for the kids. You think I'm serving God, but your life is bearing no fruit. And the Bible says that that's lukewarmness. So we have to deal with it. Why? Because as a messenger of God, as somebody that was sent uh, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, my life is not to tell you uh, that your gift is enough. My job is to tell you that you have to be bearing fruit in order to give testimony that this Holy Spirit is in your life. So let us now that I have given a little bit of context, let us get into the word of God. Let's get into James 1.5. And I want you guys to pay, pay close attention to this because this is the dangers of lukewarmness. And it says this, If anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and he will give it. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous gift. Just make sure you ask empowered by confident faith without doubting that you will receive for the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next. Being undecided make, makes you become like the rough seas, driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and tossed down the next. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? Wow. Lukewarmness. When you're excited one minute, down the other minute, wavering one minute, you know, standing up the next minute, being tossed by the wind one minute, being, you know, raising up the next minute. How can you receive what God has in store for you when you're in that condition? When your heart is so divided, when your mind is so divided, when you're not convicted and you don't believe that what is written in this book is true, when you come to church and you don't even read the Bible, you don't even pray, you don't have personal time with God, and then you come to God and you want God to fulfill all of the promises of grandeur, mm -hmm. all of the promises of extension and growth, all of the, all of the promises of, of entrepreneurship, you want God to release the millions and millions of dollars into your life, but you are half-hearted. You don't serve God with passion. You don't have zeal for God at all. And then the Apostle James is saying, how can somebody receive from God when they're in that condition? Why do we need to address this? Because people confuse the blessing as God being with them. People think that because they're being blessed monetarily, because they're being blessed with houses, with apartments, with cars, they're being blessed with companies, they're being blessed with, with territory, they're saying the hand of God is in me, but in their heart they have no passion for God. Mm -hmm. But in their heart they're not seeking God wholeheartedly. In their life there is no fruit. One day they're here, the next day they're at the club. One day they're here, the next day they're doing drugs. One day they're here, the next day they're sleeping around. One day they're here, and the next day they're confused. I don't even know if it's true anymore. Mm. How can they receive the promises that God has for us in that condition? So they come to church, and they give it a try, and because they don't commit wholeheartedly, they don't put all of their heart to it, they don't give 100% of themselves to, to God, when they go out there and they put it to the test because there's no fruit, they can't stand it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The Bible says this, and I want us all to understand this concept because the Bible says, if we are wise, a wise man that hears my teachings and puts them into practice and he lays his foundation or builds his house over the rock, when the storm comes, it's not even saying it. It's not even going. It doesn't say that because you have the your house over the rock, you're not going to have any storms. Right. 
It's saying when it comes, because it's going to come. When the conflict comes, when the hurricane comes, when conflict and all these different situations of life come hit you, that person is going to be able to sustain himself and be able to stand the test and be able to not experience any losses simply because he was convicted and wasn't half-hearted and applied it and put it into practice and was able to bear fruit. That person, when the storm came, he didn't bow down. He didn't crumble. He didn't yes. fall. So we got to be able to teach people uh, because people believe. And, and, I, and like I said, I believe people love God. Everybody loves God. I haven't met a person yet, uh, with the exception of Satanists and atheists, that has, that has told me that they don't love God. But you have to be able to, to understand that you are going to go through conflict. That you are going to go through dif difficult decision-making uh, situations. That you're going to have to deal with people not wanting to be around you. You're going to have to deal with people walking away from you. You're going to have to deal with people backstabbing you. You're going to have to deal with the sin that so easily trips you. Don't think that that sin is going to disappear simply because you're shouting the name of Jesus. They have taught us when the devil shows up and when your test shows up, just, just plead on the blood. Plead on the blood. And call out in the name of the Lord. How is that working for you? How many times have you called out on the name of the Lord and you went out right after that, you went and committed the sin? Mm. How many times you have you have you pleaded the blood of Christ and you still went out there and did what you didn't want to do? Yeah. It is not in the knowledge. Mm. It is in the fruit. It is in the application of the knowledge that you're receiving. Yeah. That's good. And they have not taught us how to apply the word of God. They have taught us simply to yell and to confess, to yell and to confess, like if by doing that, something was going to happen. When I read my Bible and it says that the Holy Spirit will remind us of the teachings of Christ so that we can apply them and put it into practice so that when the test comes, we don't fall. So that when the test comes, we, we, don't, we don't succumb to it. Yes, the Bible comes and, and it reveals to us our situation. And it says in the book of Romans, I believe it's chapter 12. And it says, you need to be able to abandon that sin that so easily trips you. You need to be able to abandon that sin that so easily trips you. And we are here expecting Jesus Christ to leave his throne in heaven, come down here, grab our hand, and pull us. Yeah. He is not going to do that. Yeah. He is not going to do that. He says, put down and throw away that sin. Who has to do that? We do. Because now we have the conviction that his word is true. Yeah. We now have the conviction that what is written here is true. And that it has power. And that it has life. So when I'm confronted with the storms that come every three months. Every three months we fall into the same category. Every three, we're good three weeks, three months. And then all of a sudden, the storm comes all over again. Yeah. God is saying the storm is not going to disappear. The storm is always going to come. Mm. The difference is going to be is, where is your conviction? Mm. How have you built? Mm. How did you apply my word? Yeah. So that when the alcohol shows up, when the girl shows up, when the guy shows up, when the drugs show up, they are going to have no power over me because they're going to show up. And, and God doesn't even leave you guessing. Right, that's good. 
He already, he's telling you, storms are coming. Yeah. He's telling you, uh, the winds are coming and they're going to blow very hard. The water is coming and it's going to, and it's going to hit your house very hard. How is your house built? Or, or is it built on stable foundation, on strong convictions, on strong passion and love for me? Or is it on a weak foundation of lukewarmness? Is it on a foundation that is made only of the, a foundation of sand that has no love for me? That doesn't have nothing to hold it to me? How is it built? And why are you surprised that you keep on failing over the same thing? Jesus is, is if I can use this so bluntly, Jesus is just baffled because you come to him and you're surprised that you fell again. <laughs> yeah. He's baffled that you come to him and, 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 and that you're surprised. He just looks at you and says, why are you surprised? Yeah. You don't love me. Mm. You don't have conviction. Mm. You don't have strong foundations. You don't apply my word. Mm. You don't seek me above everything else. Why are you surprised? Wow. That's good. But the religious system is telling us, it's the demon, brother. <laughs> it's the spirits. It's all these principalities. It's the hosts of the air. I can't overcome. And that's why you're in the condition that you're in. Because your conviction is in the wrong place. Yeah. You have more conviction in the devil than you have in God. Mm. Uh -oh. You have more conviction in a demon than you have in God. Oh my God. You have more conviction and belief in them than you have in God himself. So God wants to come here and He wants to correct this issue because when we look at the generations, forget the churches. Let's just look outside of the church and let's look at our kids. Let's look at our grandchildren. Let's look at all the generations. Let's look at them and let's see what's really affecting them. They're being infected by the church. Lukewarm. Because the church can't give, because the world can't give the church anything. It is the church that gives things. So when we look at the condition of the world, we, what we really need to look at is the condition of the church. Because when I read my Bible and I have a conviction because I believe what it says, God says that the church was going to be the institution here on the earth where all the good things were going to flow from. Everything that is good was supposed to flow from the church. So the question is, if everything that is good was supposed to flow from the church, and the world is in, the con in, in a condition of apathy, what is flowing from the church? Oh, brother, don't go to the world. Don't contaminate yourself. Stay here in the church and let's wait for the rapture. <laughs> when the Bible says... That we are the salts of the earth, yes. not the salt of the church. Mm. That we are the light to the nations, not the light of the church. Yes. Where there is light, you don't need more light. Right. You need light in the darkness. Yes. But in order to go be light in the darkness, you need to be sent into the darkness. Because if you have if you weren't sent into the darkness, then once you get into the darkness, you'll become darkness. Mm. Mm. So we need to now train up the church And we now have to wake up the church And we now have to shake up the church And we now have to be able to come here and tell the church Wake up because you're lukewarm You have no love for God There's no passion in you for God You have more fear of sicknesses than you have for God mm. You don't respect God mm. That's good and it shows every time that churches are open and you refuse to go to them. Every time you call yourself a believer and refuse to go to a church, it demonstrates your lukewarmness. It demonstrates your lack of conviction. It demonstrates your lack of love for the house of God. 
We have to be able to wake up the church and say, hey, you got to abandon your lukewarmness. You got to be able to, to be able to light up that fire that, that the Holy Spirit produces that is going to allow you to have zeal for the house of God. That is going to allow you to be able to come here and get angry out of the condition of how the church is. It is the reason why I'm here. Because I got angry at religion because I saw how religion was destroying the life of people. I got angry when I saw how religion kept people slaves. I got angry when I saw people believing lies inside yeah. the church. I got angry and upset when I saw people teaching things that would enslave people instead of freeing them. I got mad when I saw in the church people practicing witchcraft mm -hmm. instead of teaching people how to be free. Mm -hmm. I got angry. It developed a zeal in me, a passion in me. And I decided I have to do something about it. And when God saw that in my heart, he equipped me, he capacitated me, he tested me, and then he sent me. There is an order to everything. We have to be able to wake up. Let me drink water because I gotta say something. <laughs> The Bible teaches, and hang on, the Bible teaches that witchcraft is the same thing as manipulation. Yeah. And my question to the people here and the people listening are, are you an expert manipulator? Mm. You're practicing witchcraft. And the Bible says that those that practice witchcraft shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah. And if we have a bunch of people preaching and manipulating people from the pulpit, they're teaching people witchcraft and keeping people from entering the kingdom. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Teaching people how to be lukewarm. Teaching people how to violate the laws of God. In, 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 in uh, finding refuge in grace. I don't get tired of saying this. Grace is not the license for you to continue sinning and coming back to God and asking for forgiveness. Grace is the power of God that keeps you from sinning. Grace is what allows you to fulfill the law and the requirements of God. So if you say that you have received the grace of God, I will know that that is true simply by how you obey His commands. Mm. Don't tell me that you have experienced the grace of God and you're fornicating, adulterating, that you're out there in the club, that you're out there lying and cheating, that you're doing all of these things that the Bible condemns. And says that anybody that calls themselves a son or daughter of God should not practice. So we got to be able to come back and be able to start telling the church and telling, telling the sons and the daughters, come back to God. Come back to God. Abandon your sinful things that weigh you down. You know what that sin is. You know when that sin is coming. You, you already feel it in your, in your flesh. Your flesh tells you when you're about to sin. Your flesh tells you when that sin is starting to knock on the door, when that desire is coming. Your flesh warns you. And that is when you have to make a decision. I will not be subjected to the desires of my flesh. I will not bow down to the desires of the flesh because I have already committed my life to Jesus Christ. I have already committed my life to following Him and obeying Him. I have already committed to being faithful to Him. Yeah. So even though I have this desire, I will not bow down to a desire that is going to pull me away from my King. You're only going to be able to do that if you're on fire and passionate for God. If you're lukewarm, you can't do that. No matter how much you try. 
no matter how much you cry, no matter how much you beg, no matter how much you plead, you're in violation of principles. You're in violations of laws. In the law, in the, in the principle, when it's violated, it carries within itself an inherent judgment. Mm. Correct the principle that you're violating and your life will be correct. Yes. And Jesus is only simply here to be able to show you what the principle is. Which law are you breaking that keeps you a slave? What law do you need to sustain or which law do you need to be able to withhold or, or which law do you need understanding on and revelation on in order for you to be able to stand firm when the time of testing comes? Mm. Because don't tell me that for the last five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, this demon has proven to be more powerful than Jesus. Mm, right. Mm. It is the reason why God comes and he teaches us his word. Yeah. Because in his word we find that Jesus is more powerful than anybody in heaven, in the earth, and under the earth. That every yes. knee shall bow yes. in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. That there is only one person that deserves to be bowed down to. And that name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. There is only one person. Amen. And if there is only one person, why are we bowing down? To something else why is it that when we get the opportunity to steal we steal mm. why is it that when we have the opportunity to lie we lie why is it that we are jealous of our brothers and sisters why is it that we won't support them no unity mm. division why because there's revelation that is missing lukewarmness it says that a person believes one minute doubts the next minute he's undecided he may uh, and, and makes you become like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind one minute you're you're tossed down the next you're tossed down and when you're half-hearted and wavering it leaves you unstable mm. can you really expect to receive anything from the lord when you're in that condition I believe, and I believe this wholeheartedly because I've read the gospel. I believe that God wants to bless us. Mm -hmm. I believe that God wants to prosper us. I believe that God wants to extend our territories. And I believe that, that he wants to see us at the top of every mountain. I believe that. But the honest truth is, is that God is more interested in saving your soul then he isn't giving you those things. Mm. And God would rather not give you any of those things as long as he would save your soul. Mm. Because if he gives you all of those right, things yeah. and your soul is not saved, what was the whole point of you being wealthy? Right. What yeah. was the whole point of you having a house? What was the whole point of you having a large territory to rule over? What was the whole point of you being here in church if you didn't get saved? What was the whole point of you preaching from the pulpit if you didn't get saved? What was the whole point of you playing the piano and singing and, and ministering in any area of ministry if you didn't get saved? Yes, Jesus is here so that you can experience salvation but until you experience salvation, he will keep all the other things away from you. Because he knows the condition of a sinful heart is always towards evil, always towards wickedness. So if he gives you anything and you still haven't been saved and you haven't been restored and you haven't been put back in rightful position with him, the only thing that you're going to do with that is self-destruct. 
The only thing that you're going to do with that is hurt yourself, your family, and everybody around you. So don't think that God is trying to bless you or that because doors keep on opening for you that God is blessing you. Right. It can be a, a door of condemnation because it keeps you in the state that you are. Mm. I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to give you guys a, a bit of revelation here. And every time I, I speak, I always kind of... I kind of hold it down because I don't know if people have read it or not. Um, or maybe the perspective is different. When God saves someone, anybody, doesn't matter who you are, when God saves you, he, he sets you aside for a minute or two, or a season or two, meaning that He doesn't send you out to do anything, and He doesn't send you out to be, become wealthy or multi-millionaire, no, 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 He saves you and, and He kind of keeps you safe for a minute. Safe from yourself. Mm. When the Apostle Paul met Jesus on his way to Damascus, and, and he was blinded, you know, by the presence of God, he said that he became blind and his eyes, there were things like scales in his eyes. And he said that he was he was led into the city, and then he was taken to a house, and he and he was left in that house. And then he said that he spoke to, to a man called Ananias. And he said, Ananias, I, I'm, I, I have chosen Paul or I have chosen Saul to serve me so that he can go to the Gentiles. But I need you to go pray for him. Mm. I need you to go and, and, and put hands on him. And I need you to cover him. Mm. He cannot just go out and preach right. simply because he came in contact with me. Right, that's good. Wow, wow, man. Simply because he has now recognized that I am his Lord. Simply because he now knows who I am. I have put him in a house because he's still blind. Mm. <laughs> he can't see. So I need you to go and pray for him so that he can get revelation. Because the only thing that he's had is knowledge. Mm, yeah. And the knowledge that he had led him to persecute my church. Right. Led him to oh, persecute me. Led him to, to hate me. But in his mind, he thought that he loved me. Yeah. In his yeah. mind, he thought that he was doing my will. In his mind, he thought that what he was doing was, was expanding the church. But now that he knows who I am, I have put him in a house so that he can be protected. Yes, and he's still blind. He can't go anywhere. But I need you to go and lay your hands on him. And I need you to cover him so that he can now have the revelation of the kingdom. So that he can go out there and fulfill his assignment. That's so good. Yeah. He just didn't go. Right. People come here and they say, I already accepted Jesus Christ. What house do you belong to? Mm. Yes. Which house did God put you under? Mm. Who did he send to pray for you? Yes. Who did he send to remove the ignorance and to give you revelation? Yes, that's good. Mm. God will never leave you by yourself. God will put you in a house. Amen. And he will put and he will send somebody to that house so that they can, so that the scales can be removed. And that you can now be able to see clearly. And now you can be able to start understanding what your assignment is. Yes. Because your assignment is not to warm a bench. Your assignment is to go do go out there and do something for God. Yes. But how can you go out there and do something for God if you're still blind? 
if you have no revelation or understanding. Oh, but I already know who Jesus Christ is. I already accepted him. What house are you in? Have they prayed for you so that the scales can come off? Who's covering you? So my question, because I understand the kingdom and how the kingdom works, I always ask people this question when they come here. Did God send you? Who told you to come? If you came by yourself, you're going to leave by yourself. <laughs> But if God sent you here and I am assigned to you, then no matter what, you won't leave. You will stay and I will pray for you and the message will give you revelation and you will walk into your assignment. But the question is, who sent you? Who led you here? Did the Holy Spirit come and tell you, come to this house, stay in this house? If he did, then this is the house that's going to open up your eyes. Yeah. And this is the house that's going to allow you to walk into your assignment and become a, who God called you to be. But don't assume that God is going to work outside of order. Don't think that God is going to violate his word simply because you violate yours. He has an established order of how he does things. And if you wonder why your life is still a mess, it's because you still haven't submitted to the order of God. Mm. And you have decided to do whatever you think is okay. So the question is, again, who led you here? Yeah. Yeah. Who brought you here? Do you know who I am? Mm. Because I see that Ananias was, was telling God, I'm a little bit afraid of Paul. Do you know the things that Paul has done? And God says, don't be afraid of Paul. You're going to cover him. Right. You're above Paul. You're the one that's going to allow Paul to go into his assignment. And, and Ananias didn't want to go because he was afraid of because of what he had heard of Paul. But because he said, Lord... You are my Lord and you are my King and whatever you tell me, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And then he said that he goes into the house where Paul was waiting for him. And when Paul hears that Ananias was coming, he says, I was waiting for you. Because without you, I can't go anywhere. Yeah. Without you, I, I can't go into my ministry. Paul recognized Ananias even though Ananias didn't even recognize himself. Yeah. Paul recognized who Ananias was to him and what he represented in his life. And he didn't look at Ananias simply as, it is Ananias. He said, I know who you are. You came to send me to my assignment. I recognize you. I can't even see you, but I can hear the voice and I can hear who you are based on the things that you're saying. And my spirit leaps simply because you're present. Mm. Can you recognize the person that God sends to your life? Yeah. Yeah. Or have you missed it? Mm. And that's why you continue to be in a situation that you're in. I don't know who Ananias was to Paul. That they, were, they definitely weren't related. But I see the story of Jesus Christ with John the Baptist, his cousin. He could have said, John is just my cousin. Right. But he's like, no, John, if we want to be in right standing with God, it is convenient for you to baptize me. I can't baptize you. Yeah. You have to baptize me. Because that is the way God assigned it. That is the way God ordained it. That is, the, that is the way God desired it to be in order to fulfill right standing with God. God. Jesus recognized who John the Baptist was in his life. And sometimes we don't recognize the men of God in our lives. And it is the reason why we continue to be stuck. That's good. Because why? Jesus could have easily said, it's just John. But he's like, no, it's not John. 
this is the this is the priest of God yes. I'm submitting to. Yeah. It is not John. It is not Ananias. It is the one that was sent by God that I am submitting to. Mm. Yeah, so sir. And I ask people, did God send you? Mm. Am I your son? Mm. Am I your brother? Am I your cousin? Am I your friend? Or am I the man of God? Mm. Because depending on how you see me will determine your freedom. Right. That's it. Not mine. I'm already free. Mm. Ananias was already free. John the Baptist was already free. Mm. Jesus was already free. Yes, that's good. Their recognition of the man of God determined their freedom. Mm. Can you understand? Can you see? Can you hear? Do you know? Can you perceive? But how can you perceive if you're lukewarm? Oh man, I, that's just Halton. He's my buddy. I've known him for years. Yeah, that's just him. That's, I, I grew up with him. So if I, he's my son. I gave birth to him. Mm. Mary thought that she was the mother of Jesus. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Mary thought that Jesus was her son. And even Mary needed to repent and accept Jesus as Lord. Yeah, that's it. So sometimes we give birth to things that we don't even know we're giving birth to. Yeah. And and we don't and we think this is mine, and God is saying, No, I use you to bring forth what is mine. Can you recognize it? Can you see it? Mary didn't know. Because when we read the Bible. It says that everybody was coming and telling Mary, man, you, this is the, this is the Lamb of God. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. You have given birth to the Messiah today. And she said that all of those things brought conflict to her. And, and but she wouldn't tell anybody and she kept it to herself. Because in her mind is, this is my son. I gave, I gave birth to him. And, and the Holy Spirit was saying, no, this is my son. I just used you. Mm. The brothers of Jesus will come to Jesus and say, what are you doing, man? You're crazy. And Jesus will say, you think I'm your brother. I'm not your brother. I'm the Messiah. Mm. But because you don't see me as a Messiah, you don't get to receive your, your freedom. Mm. Your, your, the brothers were still stuck. What? Warm, lukewarmness doesn't allow you to see, doesn't allow you to perceive, doesn't allow you to receive revelation as to what God is doing in our generation in our midst. Mm. And I believe that there are millions and millions of people that are stuck. Because they have not found their men of God yet. Yeah. They haven't found their Ananias. They haven't found their John the Baptist. They haven't found their Jesus. They haven't found their Moses. They haven't found their Joshua. They haven't found their Elijah. They haven't found him. Mm. Because God keeps on telling them where to go. But they're not listening. Simply because of their lukewarmness. Their, 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 their half-heartedness. Their... their, their them being so unstable. Yeah. And God is saying, I want to bring stability to you. Yeah. I want to bring conviction to you. I want to bring revelation to you so that you can understand who I'm sending you to and so that you can receive them so that you can be free. Mm -hmm. So that you can receive everything that I have in store for you. It is often said, and I'm going to end it with this, that it is not who is under you that is important, but who you are under. Mm. Yes. It is more important to be under authority than to be in authority. Yeah, amen. And people love authority, but hate being under authority. 
People love telling people what to do and what to say and where to go and, and love controlling their lives. But they don't submit to nobody else. And they don't have nobody over them. And they don't have nobody checking them. And they don't have nobody there that can sit them down if they're doing something wrong. So Jesus Christ is saying, can you recognize the man of God that I'm sending to you so that you can receive your freedom because I might end it with this man. this is so good my goodness Jesus Christ came to free the entire nation of Israel but he was sent to his people and his people did not receive him right yeah. His people did not recognize who he was. Right. And they said about Jesus, you're just the son of Mary. You're just the son of the carpenter. You're just another Galilean. Who are you? Mm. Yeah. And they weren't able to receive nothing from God because they missed right. the person that God has sent to them. Okay. And people say, well, I accept Jesus. Do you accept the ones he sends to you? Mm. Yes, that's good. Jesus would say, How can you say that you love my father if you hate the one that he sent? Yeah. And he will go and he will send people. He sent 12 and then he sent the 72. And he told them, When you get to these towns, tell them this. They were sent by Jesus into these towns. Preach my message. Tell them, repent, turn away from your sins, come back to God, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those that don't receive you, shake the dust from your feet, and they have the peace returned back to you. Those who receive you, stay with them until they have had enough. Yeah. Yeah. If they reject you, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me, because I'm the one who sent you. Mm. Okay. You didn't send yourself. So we have to be able to come back and say, like, what's going on here? That's good. Can we recognize? Can we be able to see? Just like we accept Jesus Christ, we have to be able to have discernment, we have to have our eyes open to be able to accept the ones that were sent on His name. Blessed are, blessed are those that come in the name of who? The Lord. And if I come in the name of the Lord, and I'm here telling you on behalf of the Lord, because the Lord doesn't talk, I talk. Yeah. So he uses my vocal cords. So he uses my voice. And he uses my faithfulness to be able to speak exactly what he wants me to say. And I'm here telling you, abandon your lukewarmness. Abandon your sins. Walk away from those things that don't allow me to come into your life. And you think that it's me saying them and not the Lord. Then the Lord would not talk to you. Because you reject the people that he sent to you. Yeah. And just to end it, and I always say I'm going to end it, but it's so good. <laughs> it's just to end it. When, when, when Lazarus, the beggar, died and the king died, they said that they both went into, into hell, right, or Sheol. Mm -hmm. And then the king was asking uh, Abraham, Abraham, Father Abraham, can you send Lazarus to go speak to my, my family so that they wouldn't end up in this place? What did he say? He's like, no. I, you, they're not going to listen to somebody that is dead. If they don't listen to the prophets mm. and to the godly men that have been sent to them, right. what makes you think they're going to listen to the dead? That's good. Mm. Good. Hidden things in the Bible, revelation in the Bible that carry your freedom. But we have been blinded for years. Yeah. We've been in houses that have kept us blind for years, thinking that we will once they achieve freedom when Jesus Christ will come back 
the day that the trumpet will sound, that day we will finally be free. That day where our spirit is going to come out of our body and we're going to suffer no more. We're going to experience no more death and we're going to experience none of these hardships anymore. We're finally going to be free. Oh my God. But in the meantime, you have to suffer with your sin. In the meantime, you, you have to continue to beg and grovel and suffer and be afflicted and, 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 and be in the condition that you're in. You have to stay in that until Jesus Christ come back. False prophets. People that weren't sent to you. That only wanted your money. Jesus calls them salaried uh, pastors or asalariados. People that don't care about your freedom. They only care about their pockets. Because when the attack comes and the wolves will come after the sheep, the shepherds that were paid will run and leave the sheep by themselves to fend for themselves. But the good shepherd would fight for the sheep to make sure that the wolf right. wouldn't harm them. That's good. Yeah. And I ask you, what is your pastor doing? Mm. Is, he, is he laying down his life for you? Or he wants you to lay down your life for him? What is he doing? Is he assuming the risks of his calling? Like David, David killed the lion, he killed the bear, and he killed the lion. He assumed the risks. But nowadays it's like, uh uh, I can't go out there because the lion is out there. I can't go out there because a bear is out there. I can't go out there because a lion is out there. I can't go out there because a virus is out there. But you have no problem going to casinos, mm. going to malls, going to restaurants, going to all these places. But when it comes to the church, the place that is going to give you your true freedom, you don't want to come. How can you receive if you're in that condition? I want all of you guys to go home tonight with that meditation. I don't know your hearts. God knows your hearts. I don't know your condition. God knows your condition. I don't know what your struggles are. God knows what your struggles are. I don't know how your walk has been for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. God does. But I'm here telling you that God is waiting for you to come and receive him full heartedly. Yes. For you to be able to give him all of you, not half of you. Mm. He's waiting for you to commit 100% to him, not 50%, not when it's convenient, yes. not only when it's good, even when it's bad. And he promises you total restoration. He promises you that he will take you back and put you back in your original state. How you were created. In the image and likeness of God. So that you can have dominion. So that you can be fruitful. So that you can subdue your area. And that you can replenish the earth with heaven. God is waiting for us. But how can we equip people that can't stop sinning? How can we go into the next season if people just can't get past this season? The people of Israel spent 40 years in one season. Yeah. Mm. And my question is, could it be that you spent 20 years in one season as well? But God wants to take you to the next season. But he's asking for your commitment. He's asking for you to follow him wholeheartedly. And he's asking for you to finally make a decision to believe him. Because you can't enter the promised land under that condition. You will die in the desert if you don't make a decision to follow God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. 
So I'm making a call to everybody that is here today and for you that are listening on social media. Today is the day that you can make a decision to finally say, I am tired of the life that I'm living. I am tired of, of, of reliving the same season over and over. I am tired of not advancing. I am tired of God not of, of the promise of God not being fulfilled. Not because God is unfaithful, but because I'm unfaithful. I am tired of, of, of crying myself every single time that I commit a sin against God. I am tired of, of crying in bed and, and just kneeling down to God and, and God not... Me feeling that God isn't doing nothing. But it is not that God isn't doing anything. It's that you are not answering His call. It's that you are not listening to His voice. It's that you are so lukewarm that you can't even hear what He sounds like. God is calling us out today because He loves us, because He cares for us, because He wants to take us into our new season, into that new place where we will no longer talk about the struggles of the past, where our sins and our transgressions are things of the past that we no longer speak about where our, our speech is only going to be, how can we extend the glory of God? Yeah. How can we bring honor and glory to God? How can we do something to magnify the name of the Lord? How can we do something so that other people can receive the freedom that I have obtained? How can we extend the glory of the Almighty? But how can we talk about those things? If my life is falling apart. Right. If I don't love Him. As a matter of fact, it's not even about loving God sometimes. I don't love myself enough to come back to God. Mm. Because coming to God is an inside work. It's loving yourself enough to come to God. Yeah, that's good. If you don't love yourself you can never come to God. Loving yourself will bring you back to God. So God is saying, can you love yourself enough to stop doing the things that separate you from me? Mm. Stop criticizing. Stop being jealous. Stop being prejudiced. Stop doing all of these things that defile you. It is time to come back. Yeah, it is time to come back to God. And to restore the hearts of the fathers back to the sons. And the sons back to the father. It is time to restore the family. It is time to restore the marriages. It is time to restore the relationships. Yeah. It is time to come back to unity. It is time to become one body. For God says that the world will know that you are mine by how you love each other. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just want to thank you, Father, for speaking your word tonight. I just want to thank you, Father, for everything that you're doing in this generation, Father. Yes, thank you. That even if other people don't perceive what is going on, Father, I perceive what your spirit wants to do, Father. Yes, your spirit is in the business of restoration, Father. Yes. Of restoring people back yes. to their original condition, Father. Yes. It's of removing the sins and the reproaches in the, in the lives of the people. Your spirit is in the business, Father of removing every blemish and covering up and removing everything that separates us from you, Father. Your Spirit is here, Father, to guide us into all truth, to remind us of every word that ever came out of your mouth so that we can be able, Father, to apply it in our lives, Father, and be able to receive every single one of those promises that you have for us, Father. 
I am here, Father, as someone that was sent into this generation, Father, as somebody that answered the call, as somebody, Father, that understands your heart and understands what you're looking for. I'm here, Father, calling out, Father, to your sons and to your daughters, to your people, Father. From everywhere, Father, from the ones that are sitting in these chairs to the ones that are watching, Father, in social media. And we make the call, come back to God. And we make the call, come back to your Lord. Listen to his voice. Leave your apathy and your coldness. Leave your lukewarmness behind and come back to God. Receive an impartation of His Spirit that is going to infuse encouragement into your life. That is going to infuse power into your life. That is going to infuse determination and commitment into your life. So that you can follow your Lord and your King until He comes back. I'm here making a call to your people that they don't have to be subjected to the desires of their flesh any longer. That they are now have the, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. It's the same power that is in them as well. It is the same power that is in them that is uplifting them. So that they can be able to overcome every obstacle that the enemy presents. It is the same power that allows them to overcome every storm that comes their way. As an emissary, as an ambassador of your kingdom, Father. I make a call to all your kingdom citizens, Father. To all of those that are lukewarm and that they need a church where they're going to learn how to love you. They're going to learn how to worship you. They're going to learn how to know who you are, Father. We call them to your house, Father. We call each and every one of them, Father, to come back to the house of God. Amen. To come back and be equipped. To come back, Father, and receive an impartation of your presence that is going to take them, Father, to the place that you have for them, Father. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we bless everybody that is here and we bless everybody that is watching through social media. Amen. And amen. Now let's go ahead and stand in the same spirit um, as we're about to collect this offering. Um, how many of you received from tonight's word? Um, God is always good. Uh, his word never fails. Uh, but we're going to collect the offering. Um, as our pastor said earlier, remember that we do not give out of manipulation. We, we do not give to manipulate God or to receive anything from Him. But we give out of honor to Him, out of honor to His word, out of honor to this house. Um, and in that same spirit, let's also remember that giving to God is just, it's not just monetary. Um, it's also as we live our lives, how much time do we give to God reading his word? How much time do we spend giving God his praying time, his worship time, developing our relationship with him? So as we give monetary, let's also keep that in mind. So let's give God his time in our daily lives. Um, so, and if you guys are going to give through online, you can give through Zeller Quick Pay at Honor Seat at house6633.com. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you, Lord, Father God, for this day. Lord, thank you for this word that you've given us, Father God. We just bless these seeds that everybody is planting in your kingdom, Father God. We pray that they're seeded in fertile soil, Father, and that you bless their every need, Father God. Your word says that as long as we seek your kingdom and its righteousness, Father God, you will take care of all our needs, Father God. You know all our bills, Father. You know everything that we need for our families, Lord, and we know that you are taking care of it, Father God. Anything, Father, that we need, Lord, is all already in our lives father god we just ask that and we pray that we can walk into it and bring it to fruition father god when we may we be good stewards father of everything that you've given us lord good stewards over our families good stewards over our jobs good stewards over our relationships in our lives father and we just love you and we praise you in the name of jesus amen have a blessed night amen